watching the guys go out there and do that so often without ever fearing for their own lives, not in any form of cowboy heroism, but just for the fact that we had a job to do. We trusted each other so much and we were more fearful of letting each other down and failing the mission than we were of our own lives. Welcome to Life on the Line. I'm Alex Lloyd, and this is the first episode of Season 5. Since 2017, Life on the Line has brought to you the stories of Australian military veterans. This is our 207th podcast, or our 102nd veteran conversation due to our particular numbering system. In all that time, we've brought you stories from World War II to the modern era. Today's guest is a Special Forces veteran of the 21st century conflicts in Afghanistan and Iraq, Heston Russell. We're recording this chat on Heston's outdoor balcony of his Sydney apartment. So if you hear some background noise, birds chirping, or Heston's adorable dog chasing after the birds, that's where that noise is coming from. We're recording outdoors today as we're actually videoing this interview, which on our main podcast is a first for us. You can watch this video on YouTube, youtube.com slash life on the line podcast, or you can also listen to the full audio version wherever you get your podcasts, Spotify, and our website, life on the line podcast.com. We'll be doing a handful of these video podcasts as the year rolls on, in addition to our upcoming video documentary series, Life After Service. But today's guest is a officer of the 2nd Commando Regiment, a veteran, Heston Russell. Heston already had a profile due to his post-military career in the fitness world, in particular bringing Barry's boot camp to Australia. He rose to further national prominence in 2020, when an unnamed US soldier accused his platoon of killing a prisoner unlawfully in Afghanistan. Heston counterattacked and came on national media to strongly refute the claims. He has remained in the spotlight since as a spokesperson for the veteran community in the lead up to and in the wake of the Brereton report into alleged war crimes in Afghanistan. And today I'm here to find out more about the man behind the headlines. Heston Russell, welcome to Life on the Line. G'day Alex, thanks for having me on. Thank you for having us in your home. Yeah, welcome. We're going to jump right back Heston. Okay. Tell me, where were you born? Where did you grow up? Uh, I was born here in Sydney, in Westmead. Uh, I think at about one year old, then we moved to Fayetteville, North Carolina. Dad was in the military. Uh, he was a parachute jump instructor, and we spent uh, a posting over there as he worked with the US parachuting element. Then came back, did my schooling here, kindergarten grade one, then moved up to Brizzy and completed all of my, the rest of my schooling up there in Brisbane, uh, primary school, high school, and then went to ADFA in Canberra. So part Sydney side, uh, part Queensland boy. Yeah, I have to say my heart's probably in Queensland. Um, come state of origin, I do still support Queensland. That's the test. Yeah, I, I mean, I've been in Sydney since 2010, military-wise, um, in and around Sydney. Uh, so the majority of my career has been here, but yeah, heart's probably still in Queensland. You mentioned your father and that instruction work he's doing. Did you have any other military history in the family? Yeah, for sure. So uh, my on my mother's side, uh, her father, uh, my grandfather, he just passed away in December, but he was a section commander and then a platoon sergeant on the hook with uh, Touraya in, Co- in the Korean War. In the yeah. Korean War, yeah. He was there when uh, ceasefire was called and the, and the war ended and that's some awesome stories. And then he went to Vietnam again. He was actually the first regimental sergeant major of the 8th Battalion. Um, RAR, uh, and yeah, did his time in Afghanistan. And actually his wife, my nana, was one of the first uh, army female PTIs. But um, back in those days, they got married in their 20s and she had to leave. <laughs> you weren't allowed to be no, employed. You, c- yeah. you couldn't continue your service once you married, yeah. Yeah, that's it. So um, and I've got a brother. He's also had a stint in the military. Um, but yeah. That's quite a lot of heritage that I can see directly influencing you from the PTI aspect into uh, your grandfather, which that's an inspiring amount of service. So yeah. was it just kind of normalised to you, the concept, though, of like military service, Anzac, Australiana? Well, to be honest, no. I mean, I grew up in a uh, military family, particularly just with dad 
you know, um, when we moved back here from the US, we lived in a, uh, the Mary Quarters in Nowra and I loved it. You know, you'd pull the bins across the street and you'd be playing cricket with the rest of the kids and, you know, you'd go onto the base and do the obstacle course with an ammo crate with an egg in it that you couldn't break and all this. But I, I never actually really heard much ever from my grandfather on his military service, to be honest, uh, until I was well into my career. Um, he just didn't speak about it. You know, he was sort of of that generation, came back, got himself a professional fishing boat and sort of lost himself for the next 14 years. Um, and really, just last year was when he really opened up to me. But during the whole military immersion family around with Dad, uh, that's where I got to grow up around a lot of other military families. And a few of those sons that I grew close to were actually a bit older than me. And actually one of them went through the path that was ad for an RMC and even to the commandos. So I was probably more so influenced around that immediate group to lead me into the military, yeah. Well, I am sorry. I did observe on your Instagram of your grandfather's passing and could only try to imagine the impact that would have had on you, especially I'm sure he would have been very proud of you in all the public-facing work you've been doing in the veteran community of late and would have had more to share with you in those yeah. last months. Yeah, he was a large uh, inspiration, to be honest, particularly me stepping up Voice of a Veteran. And that uh, Voice of a Veteran is simply just like a, a platform or a profile that I needed to feel comfortable putting myself out there, not putting Heston Russell forward with my story, putting it out there as trying to do uh, a platform for all veterans. And I actually went over and saw him in was it September when we thought he was going to pass. Um, and that's when he really started to open up and having his conversations about his own troubles, like even with the DVA, with his own transition process and with what he was seeing in the world of today. And it was absolutely fantastic. You know, his body was failing so badly but his head and his heart his his mind and his heart were just so warm and alive and um yeah he said he's very proud and all that but uh yeah i mean look it was it was definitely his time to pass um you know he was 90 years old and like i said his head and heart were holding on but his body had to go so it's actually a great comfort that he is gone to be honest um but yeah a great memory and a great legacy i carry his middle name as mine graham so again it's a uh, big shoes to fill let's jump back in time okay what is the driving factor then for you to join ADFA or is it just a combination yeah. of all these influences and that group you mentioned? Yeah, um, I remember I think it was grade 10, so 1990, grade 10, so it was 2000. Um, I actually, the first time went to the defence recruiter and I just said straight away, I want to be a commando because I'd actually seen my friend do that. Uh, and that's where he's like, okay, well, there's a number of ways you do that, but there's a few steps you need to do in between. And that's when he showed me ADFA and all that. And I, I just knew I wanted to leave wherever I was um, I grew up in Fernie Grove. There wasn't a lot going on there up in the northern suburbs of Brisbane. I knew I needed and I wanted to get like a degree. You know, that was the thing to do. Finish school at 17. So I just wanted that structure. And it was always the goal to become a commando. Literally, it was always the goal to become a commando. So ad for an RMC were always um, a, a means to an end. Everything was a means to an end. Um, and that was really my, my forethought and that was really my purpose. Um, so it was even fascinating looking back on that, even throughout all the years where I actually hated doing the study and hated doing all that, but it was always to become a commando, essentially, yeah. Leaving aside the academic aspect yeah. of your work there, when you started that basic military training, was that gelling with you going, yes, this is exactly where I want to be going? Yeah, it was, it was awesome to be, you know, tested physically. I mean, I played rugby and all that beforehand, and, you know, that group sport, that team camaraderie, but then also, you know, doing things that were extremely relevant, you know, learning skill sets that were ultimately to make you better at defending our nation. Um, and then, you know, being tested and being put together in a team, uh, it was it was fantastic, you know, to be forced to have friends and then to be put through these, these adver adversities together and to appreciate that they were real and tangible skill sets you were receiving. I, I loved, I weathered through the academic periods and then thrived when we went to our bush periods. But it was also, you know, things like even an ADFA, we, you know, drill and ceremony every Tuesday and Thursday mornings, you know, white glove inspections every Friday mornings. I actually kind of really loved that because it really made me very disciplined and made me very um, proud and been having attention to detail in my own dress and bearing and my own surroundings. And, you know, thank God I did it because I would have been such a brat here and now if I didn't. Do you... At the time you're getting all those minor lessons, like that attention to detail, are you then appreciating why they're imparting this to you, why they're drilling you in this particular way, or do you look back more and sort of take those reflections later? Oh, there's a lot of just being stuffed around. <laughs> um, For the sake of it? Yeah, I, yeah. honestly, I really did love, uh, I actually loved drill, and I loved like ironing my uniforms, and you know, just having that 
pride in your own appearance, um, appreciating, unfortunately, the world is actually so superficial that the, the effort you can go into, at least in those initial first impressions, is really critical. And that really helped me out later in the Special Forces career when it's very easy to deviate from that path. Um, but, you know, even just drill and ceremony, you know, being more coordinated and being proud of, like, your actions and how you're carrying yourself and there's just all that sort of um, body language type stuff as well. Um, but you're right, a lot of the lessons <laughs> were definitely lost on me at the time and you, you realise them afterwards. Well, you endure that and you've yeah. still got that focus commando. That's it. Yeah, that's, that's the it. goal. That's it. Uh, before I ask about that particular journey, was yeah. there... SASR or Commando, it was just not Commando, that's where you wanted to be, East Coast? Well, I always wanted to be Commando and it really came down to actually, again, just before I joined ADFA, um, the, I used to go back down to a place, Parks, Peak Hill in New South Wales and I used to, um, the, the dad, um, Jeff Stevenson, was actually the commanding officer, of, I think it was the 119 RNSWR back in the day, when my dad was the OPSO, so it was actually his son, Tristan, that I watched go through and even back uh, I'd go down there every school holidays and try and help and r- out and rouse about or just, you know, go on the farm and, you know, shoot things and do all that. But Trista would be coming back from ADVA break holidays with his mates. Um, and then afterwards, once I was actually going through ADVA and all that, uh, I caught up with his guys and one of them, you know, he was a commando, he was SAS, the other friend. And I really got to actually dive into and listen to what they were currently doing. And I really always wanted to go commando for the role. It was the direct action role, particularly as a platoon commander, to command those larger forces um, in those more deliberate actions. Um, I didn't really like sneaky picky. Um, it just wasn't for me. I don't have the not your style. attention span and the patience. And that's, that's it. But it's funny you say that because we'll probably come to it later because in real, really heavy decision point came in 2009 when I was in my uh, third year as a platoon commander up in 2 IR. And I was really trying hard to... I wanted to do commando selection in February of 2010. And I was really trying hard to get a posting down to Sydney in order to best facilitate that. Uh, And at that time, they weren't doing the direct non-qual postings into the unit. So the best thing I could do was get one to headquarters, one commando regiment. And then all of a sudden, while I was on my uh, grade grade three captain's course in Canungra, I got offered a posting order direct into SASR as a part of their non-qual piece. And, of course, um, the CEO of uh, who I had at RMC is a guy, Dan Fortune, uh, who is a SAS uh, officer. And he was, of course, uh, at the captain's course giving a presentation about uh, one of the special operations task groups, missions and deployments he was a commanding officer for. Uh, and then so he was putting the push on me to go to SAS, you know. And I really, for that time, got a bit... Got a little bit ahead of myself and thought, right, you know, I'm, you know, I can't get a direct posting in. This is the best bet. Let's go do this. And anyway, I ended up sticking to my guns. And Dan Fortune actually did a great thing. He said, "Hey, why do you want to join Special Forces? What role do you want to do?" And I told him, and he said, "Well, cool. Then you need to decide." And I did, and I said no to that. Very fortunately, later the next month, all of a sudden, Two Commando decided to open up direct postings, and I actually got a posting direct to Two Commando and did the selection later in February. And um, I've always maintained that that's definitely the role I always wanted to do. And I'm so happy that I stuck to my guns and didn't actually get carried away with just getting a beret um, because it really comes down to, as you know, like the, the purpose, the purpose of why you want to do things. Um, and that was my focus from the start and that was my focus all the way through. Well, you endure ADFA, you get through RMC, you yep. endure 2R, RAR, let's say. And I then love 2RR, don't get me wrong, I absolutely enjoyed it. Um, but it was, the one, it was the step in the journey to the place you wanted to go. Well, that's it. That's the fascinating part for me. So, you know, like I said, means to an end. Everything was a means to an end to become a commando. Uh, and then even particularly the transition from ADFA to RMC, like I loved RMC because it was done with the academics and you were really into learning like military academics and you're really starting to getting more trained professionally on leadership. You know, really looking back now, actually being professionally invested as uh, studying in leadership Um, and then trialling it, and then trialling it, you know, out in the field with trying to lead your peers, trying to lead people who are trying to demonstrate their own leadership, and it's fantastic. It was really the greatest situation and incubator for um, the foundation for my personal leadership style and skills that, you know, people aren't born as leaders, and I've really now realised that it comes down to your training and experience. But then two hour, that transition up to there, was when all of a sudden I was like, holy cow, it is amazing being responsible for and leading soldiers. 
uh, I definitely went into it thinking like, you know, I need to do my best here to set myself up to be a commando. But then all of a sudden I just became infatuated with how amazing it was to be trusted to be a platoon commander and how amazing some of the people that I got to work with and be responsible for. And um, I, I could have happily, you know, stayed the rest of my days up there. But, you know, as is the natural progression, you know, once I had my two years as a rifle company and one year in support company to then to then move on. But my old five platoon Bravo company, the Spartans, they, they will always carry a very key spot uh, in my head and in my heart. Um, you know, that was definitely a really key piece of me that helped me be who I am today. Well, I think that's symptomatic of great leadership that you're not focused on the role, you're focused on the people. Yeah, well, and I think the best, the key thing about that is it's actually what I didn't realise because, you know, going through your training at RMC, you definitely all care about each other. But again, you're all under assessment. You're all like trying to perform. You're all um, going through your own training. Uh, and it's so easy for people to carry through that sort of careerist focus to then into um, their first command appointment. Uh, and I honestly went into that, you know, you always get told about looking after the people and what it's going to be like, but I definitely went into it thinking that, you know, I need to be focusing on what I need to do to achieve my stepping stones. And I was just so happily surprised by the fact that, hey, you know, here is actually true purpose. And regardless of what happens to you, like these are the people that are more important. Um, and, yeah, not, not going in there expecting that, but discovering that uh, was really, really insightful for myself to learn from. How would you find commando selection? Uh, good. Still, hands down, uh, one of the hardest things I've ever done. In RMC, you do an exercise called Shaggy Ridge, which is three days, uh, which is a food and sleep deprivation exercise. And uh, that, was, that was actually really hard and a really great reference point for me. Um, I pr- was probably more hungry on uh, Shaggy <laughs> Coffer squeaking his toy. Yeah, yeah, Heston's <laughs> dogs. I'm having fun with the toy in the background. Coffer. This is live outdoor podcasting. These are the symptoms <laughs> of that, mate. It's all good. And he's not giving, giving And he away. wants a guest appearance, I understand. He does. He's very photogenic. But I was we'll never, get him on camera later. Uh, <laughs> I was never as hungry on commando selection course as I was on Shaggy Ridge, but the commando selection course is fantastic. When I did it in 2010, it was six weeks. And that's probably the hardest part. I didn't realise like how long it was, you know. Shaggy Ridge was nowhere near that. It was like f- three or five days or maybe whatever. Um, selection course was really hard. You know, I started with a group of 120. Also training up for my selection course, I trained up with a buddy of mine um, who was actually one of my section commanders up at Turao. And uh, we got through it all together and we're there starting selection together. And you just go through all the different phases and the phases, you know, break you down uh, physically uh, and mentally to reveal reveal who you are emotionally and what your true purpose is to be there. And, you know, you start with 120 and then you just start to see people drop like flies. 80% of the people on selection courses withdraw themselves at own request with the form. Um, and, you know, it hurt. I started at just above 90 kilos. I finished just below 80 Wow. I, I could hold a toothbrush in my abs. It was pretty cool, but I was like not <laughs> looking good. You don't recommend that as a normal approach? No, I definitely don't. But um, it hurt. You know, I had a bit of a, a knee niggle leading into it and I sort of hurt it during the course and I thought I was going to be over, but managed to, to crack on through. And um, I really prepared myself well for the section course. I did the whole 12-week training program to a T. And my, physically, I was weaponized i actually did like a yoga an eight week sorry i did a 12 week yoga course while i did the 12 week lead up training as well so like my flexibility and mobility was fantastic um i had uh, methylated spirits my feet for like three months beforehand so i didn't get i barely got any blisters and for my feet that's like amazing that's a good cheat yeah it was good and uh it was fascinating because particularly of the other officers on the course i was the youngest officer on out of the group i think we started with a group of 14 or 15 officers and one of the other officers was like the adjutant of RMC when I was there as a cadet oh, wow. you know all these other guys had far more experience had been on deployments to Afghanistan or Iraq beforehand um, and I really felt like out of my league with these guys but um, selection course enabled me to very quickly like put that imposter syndrome behind me and focus on the pain that I was going through and just truly truly test yourself and I still say this that the selection course was the hardest thing that I've ever done in my career um, just because of the way in which it t- breaks you down to reveal your emotional core and also just the duration and also for it's a whole period under assessment. Uh, and it's always been a great reference point to look back to uh, whereby I, I wanted to pull myself off the selection course at one point when we go to activities and you come back together 
in the morning and that's when you sort of see like, oh, wow, you know, we're down about to another 30 people or something. And one of those mornings I came back in and that guy that I trained up with, my buddy, or one of my best mates who I trained up with, um, the section commander for selection, uh, he was gone. He would join himself at own request. And he had a, a wife and I think he had two kids at that stage. And it, it left me to wonder, it's like, you know, well, if he doesn't want to do it, you know, do I still want to do it? And well, this that was the first time I really truly doubted my purpose. Um, we'll probably talk about later and that's that purpose of the mission or the purpose for those men, as you said, about the resource responsible for. And I sort of felt for him um, and felt that maybe that my purpose was waning. But long story short, um, I was able to push through that. But there was definitely, you know, a 15 minute period and they even put like this nasty staff member on me to absolute punish me. He was just an officer hater. Well, that it's like was sharks his- in the water. They could smell the blood of your self-doubt. Well, that was his role. I mean, by this time we were all physically stuffed and they put, I, I have this bad habit of always smiling and they put this staff member on me, a spider. <laughs> Mission, make Heston frown. He was, he, and he was into me. And, you know, it was the good old, oh, you think you're better because you're an officer. It's, it's, a, it's a role, it's a character you give a few other staff members. And he was, you know, he was very good at it. And it was just to the point that you want to just go like, F you, like, I'm done with this. Um, but, yeah, and again, it was, it, was, it was, again, great to be pushed to that point whereby... I wasn't broken, you know, I, I couldn't not do it, but I almost didn't want to do it. And that was so fascinating for myself to, again, go to that mental and emotional place and to, again, come back from that. So that sounds like rather than, say, learn something new about yourself, you more just self-validated, yes, I can do this, yes, this is my purpose, I am right in being here and correct. It was more affirmation than learning. Yeah, absolutely. And I don't want to jump too ahead of it because then I finished off my career you know, running the selection course as well. So I'm able to now really bookend that, those experiences and really appreciate so much more about myself. And it was actually then running the selection course later on that really helped me unlock a lot of those self-discoveries from back in the day. But long story short, to summarise selection course, it was a fantastic point of reference and something I always reference back to um, as far as how hard I was pushed physically, mentally and emotionally. And um, just, you know, knowing and understanding that about yourself. How long from completing selection and all the subsequent training that yep. follows is it until your first deployment to Afghanistan? Ah, oh, that's a good question. Um, so Roughly. Selection, yeah, selection was February. So then did all the Rio courses for the rest of that year. So then November ended up taking over domestic counterterrorism roles. November platoon, your platoon. Yeah, sorry. In November, I took over November. Oh, in November. Are you in November? You took over <laughs> in November. In November, I took over How November. Fishing. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and they had just come back from their trip to Afghanistan. So they got, they were over there. Uh, yeah, they were over there 2010. Oh, the, this would be the trip with the um, terrible helicopter crash in June. Yeah, so yeah. that was November platoon. Yeah. So, um, yeah, and I mean, like, you know, Timmy Applin was one of my drill sergeants at uh, RMC. We've spoken with a survivor of that crash, Gary Wilson. Oh, yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah well, and that was, and that's the key thing. You know, I, I took over November platoon at the end of that year and tragically lost the three guys. But there was also the rest of those in the helo that were injured. You know, and a, a third of the platoon had pretty much been knocked out. Um, so it was it was quite a, a rebuild phase. But fortunately, we brought in a, a few of the guys off my um, selection course as well. And anyway. Well, sorry, actually, to interrupt there, then you talked earlier about 2RAR, you get in there and you actually feel that weight of responsibility of leading these men. But then when you're taking charge of a platoon where some of those members have seen something horrific like that and the pressures must feel even more real and that it's that weight actually is extra that you're coming into. Well, just taking over, a, just being the platoon commander of a special forces platoon in itself, you know, I I've, I've finished my selection, I was 25 years old and I took over the platoon as the youngest person in the platoon. Um, you know, I had what, three, four sergeants, uh, you know, guys who'd done five, six, seven deployments uh, before me. Um, I still yet to be deployed on active, on, sorry, uh, on active service, on combat service. Uh, but, and I was very physically capable, but again, these guys, you know, were so experienced. And it was really, honestly, very intimidating. Uh, but that's where I just put my head down, my bum up, and my, let my actions do the talking. Um, my dad always said these two things, be good at your job and be a good person, and the rest will fall into place. So I, w- I, w- I was very fortunate, particularly during the Rio course, and I was very good on a lot of the um, basic skill sets. You know, I'm a, I'm a very good shot. Um, I was very physically capable in all these sort of things. So 
uh, I could definitely give most of the guys a, the run for the money and particularly then re- rotate it onto the domestic counterterrorism role, um, which is really, really heavily invested in those um, core martial skills. So I was definitely got myself highly involved in the training with the guys and then just really made sure I sat and assimilated as much as I could. Um, you know, and you just do the, the look and listen and, and find your way around and just let your actions do the talking. But it was very intimidating. But at the same time, it was actually incredible being around all these guys who had all these experience um, and were so filled with initiative and so filled with, you know, what, what really mattered. You know, th- particularly coming from the bigger army, there's so much rules for the reasons of rules, you know, from hands in pockets to whatever, whereas like most people see that in special forces being a lack of discipline. It's, it's, it's actually not. It's just what's relevant. You it's know? what's practical. It's what's practical. And some people can take it a bit too far, um, but, yeah, it just sort of comes down to the purpose. Why are you doing? What are you doing? Um, and if we couldn't understand or have those conversations, then it was irrelevant. So you're busy... Learning the ropes in a sense, being yeah. a new officer, and you are helping glue the platoon together or attempting to while I wait the birds to go away. You're, you're, you you're, are, you're I have never seen these birds that you are literally attracting. I, I didn't realize I had that magnetic charm. Copper, do more of a job getting rid of them. That's it. Good job. He's, try, he's getting he's, swooped by him. What is going on here? Yeah, Sorry. There's, oh, it, oh, we've been swarmed. Um, We're <laughs> literally having a bird attack there's the lorikeets versus well crewman thomas k a lot of thistle productions running to help disperse them um so heston my question is <laughs> you're busy forging the platoon gluing it together learning the ropes yourself yeah. and you've got the counterterrorism role first yeah. up and i guess how how do you find shifting through the gears of at one point you're training for the counterterrorism role you know at some point you're going to be deployed again the operation slipper is ongoing yeah how are you finding it both learning the ropes, intimidating, you've said, but then actually getting closer to those points of being either deployable domestically or internationally. Yeah, I mean, as far as, like, gluing the platoon together, I I mean, I had some fantastic senior NCOs who pretty much did that for me. Um, You know, again, I just had to be good at my job. And even the the wing sergeant major who ran the selection course then came over and was our company sergeant major. Um, it It was brilliant, you know, sort of having that cohesion with the team there. But the domestic counterterrorism role, again, is just so heavily focused on martial skill sets. I mean, the training, you know, picture going to the range and having more ammunition than you can shoot and shooting until your finger literally hurts, you know, and that's every single week. Um, You know, every week was built into a training program whereby you'd have a a day at the range, you know, you'd have a day doing insertion skill sets, you'd have a day doing um, direct action or emergency action um, rehearsals, you know, you'd have a day doing other specialist skill sets, be those method of entry, demolitions, driving, um, you know, and you get involved with all that training at my individual level because, you know, even on that role as a platoon commander, you have to command your brick and you have to be there ready and good to go. And then you're spending the time in the afternoons doing the admin and all that good stuff. But it was actually just fantastic, again, being able to bring the team together through that training and getting in there and actually um, putting your skills to the test and developing yourself. Whilst at the same time, uh, particularly within 2 Commando, I mean, the, the companies are all position in their roles per year so uh you know one company had just come back from its last tour to afghanistan and just by the fact of being in the same base and officers mess and all that sort of stuff you're already assimilating lessons learned and there are actually like official lessons learned that are provided to all of the unit by the company that just comes back and then you're tying into those i mean the the mission was just evolving so rapidly and the biggest thing for me was actually trying to get my head around the fact that how quickly it was evolving Uh, you know in in the larger army you know, I've been to Timor and you'd seen these other deployments whereby they're relatively constant. Whereas over there, you know, it changed from then having to have partner force on the ground through to next thing that we were partnering, partnering with the DEA, the Drug Enforcement Administration, through to now we're doing operations in Helmand. Um, it was just such a head spin. Uh, and to be honest, I never actually fully really got my head into it properly until I went over there in 2011 or no, 2012, start of 2012 for the actual advanced recon. But before then was my first appointment in Afghanistan, which was in 2011. And that's where I took Prime Minister Gillard over as uh, I was her personal security officer. And that was my first ever trip to Afghanistan. And I felt so out of my depth. <laughs> you know, I hadn't done a combat tour or any of that, but um, it was just so awesome getting over there and seeing it. And that's when it really started to, to put the pieces together in my head as to what the role was going to likely be and then try and start to bring that back and have those conversations with my guys back in Australia. Yeah, not to underplay the 
PSD, the PSD role. But yep. yeah, you are. Ha- it's like a if, call it a sample or an entree of the main deployment to come. You're getting a taste of it, doing that brief trip over with the prime minister, and it's giving you. A, an introduction to the country before you're deploying there in that kind of full platoon capacity. Yeah, well, I felt like such an imposter too, like turning out with the Prime Minister at their Camp Russell and up at, at those, that's a special forces base up on Tarrantcow. I mean, they're all, like the other platoon commanders and all that were all my mates and I knew a few, a few of the other guys in the platoons because they were on the selection with me, but they're like, yeah, I hadn't even done an SOTG deployment yet and there I am like escorting the Prime Minister. It was pretty funny. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, <laughs> I was very fortunate to be there and do it uh, and it was a, it is definitely a very different role you know and that's just the best part about the unit was the different roles we had and the variety that was presented to us and those opportunities did you feel when you go over for the second time for that first full deployment shall we say do you yeah. feel ready do you feel you've got purpose driven or do you feel imposter syndrome still no nah, absolutely I mean that the lead up to that was huge particularly coming off um, domestic counterterrorism the tag role uh, like you're, you're at the best levels of your fundamental skill sets. It's then just adapting that to the what we call green rolls version, you know, even from a, a tactical, you know, domestic counterterrorism is all about getting into the target as quickly as possible because from um, point of exposure through to uh, point of impact, let's say, uh, is the time in which, you know, you need to be able to save the lives of the hostages or bad people can do bad things to the hostages. So it's all about getting in there as quick as possible and even like sacrificing yourself in doing so. Whereas in the green roles, you have to slow things right back down and it's more about that stealth, um, that clandestine um, and that also more deliberate because there's threats like IEDs and all that sort of stuff as well. So there was a very detailed transition phase, including the mission rehearsal exercises and our own lead up training. But again, you know, I had weapons, uh, weaponized platoon sergeants and section commanders um, who and team commanders who would take the guys through all that training uh, in our normal platoon training weeks and again these are guys who've been there three four five six times you know and even they were briefing me on i was learning so much from them and then we were still learning so much together because we were also realizing how quickly things were changing so by the time we hit the ground running uh middle of 2012 we were really really well prepared and even then again as a part of that transition into country you know, I get to go over there with my um, platoon sergeant and team commanders for uh, a week or two ahead of the rest of the guys. And we actually go and embed with one of the other platoons, who was one of my mates, and go out on missions and tasks with them. And you actually do like a proper handover of one. It's like a nursing patrol. Ta- yeah. Nursery patrol, yeah. Like tactics on the ground. But two, like key relationships. You know, I took over the relationship with the task force gunfighter US Ahilos who were in support of us. And then over to... You go to Kandahar and meet with all the guys who are actually flying the UAVs and drones and stuff overhead and then you meet with like fighter pilot dudes from the other countries who are actually flying and supporting a mission. So it was then by the time the platoon arrived, you know, I felt very, very comfortable. And, you know, you are actually in the position whereby then with the other um, platoon staff uh, helping them come up to speed with the mission that's ahead of them. Um, so, yeah, it, it was really, really a very professional process. When you get out into that first patrol or first operation or first contact, how do you find yourself measuring up against your own expectations? Yeah, the first first mission, the first mission of my own, um, you know, outside of the nursery patrols when we first deployed as a platoon, um, was a dry hole. <laughs> Nothing happened. Um, Anticlimactic then? It was hilarious, you know, because you sit there and you're like, right, what's going to happen? Nothing. <laughs> Uh, the guy we were looking for wasn't even there. Uh, it was just a big old dry hole. But you know, it was just fantastic getting out there and, and operating it. And it was, it felt so weird. Uh, we always would come back to the platoon lines and do a debrief, like a hot wash. And the guys were funny. Uh, my team commanders had organised a cake, <laughs> so we're there doing this debrief. <laughs> and then one of them disappeared. The next thing, my one one. He just had this shit in grin and they brought in this cake and it popped my cherry with my first mission. You know, that's the sort of camaraderie you had. Um, you know, you can't take yourself too serious. And it Does was, it count as a cherry pop if it's a dry hole? Oh, uh, look, it was my first combat mission. I know I, I didn't even say that. The guys were just being funny because, you know, by this time, this is 2012. I joined uh, ADFA in 2003 and, you know, even, uh, you know, my day, my three years in uh, Touraine and Townsville, and then by then it had been a year and a half at the officer's mess in uh, Tucumato. You know, I still had, like, my Timor gong and my Coca-Cola gong, and, you know, it was it was really like a becoming a bit, not a bit, in my head, in hindsight, you know, it was a bit of a complex, you know, it's like I haven't been on um, operations yet, you know, 
everyone else in that mess had been on Afghanistan, Iraq, and again, because I was so young, um, it was really like, you know, I need to prove myself and all this. So I put a lot of expectations on myself and there's so much that I learned in hindsight about how relevant all that was. But, you know, I was 25, 26, 27. It was, it was a phase. It was a learning phase. And so you've then, had this goal for nine years. It's been yeah. deep passion and purpose. And then you finally get to it and it's That's it. not what you were exactly hoping for. Yeah. And I mean, the best lesson I've learned is just to stop and smell the roses along the way, to be honest. You know, these... I know you made me wear my medals for this, but like... Me- I, we yeah. invited you to wear your yes. medals. <laughs> asked me to wear my medals. But like medals don't make it the man. I mean, I remember back in my ad for days, there was one of our staff members who had like 14... No, they had 14, had like seven medals on their chest. And I was like, oh my God, wow, like that's amazing. And then that person's just like, you know, I'm a, I'm a clerk. I got deployed all over the place, um, you know. Ne- and he was, he was actually the first person to say, never look at someone's medals and automatically assume that they're one, good at their job, or two, a good person. And medals demonstrate experience. It's what you do with that experience that is what counts. Um, you know, and I spent so long thinking that I was inferior with my three gongs. But then that deployment 2012 um, was the absolute highlight of my career, um, whereby, again, that incredible responsibility of leading people um, overseas and in combat and seeing them rise to just such amazing greatness individually and collectively. Literally uh, going out, we went on, on 67 missions, that, that um, deployment. You know, everything was drawing down in Afghanistan and we were just being deployed left, right and centre. And, you know, we were, we were very good, particularly coming off um, domestic counterterrorism roles. You know, again, those martial skills, we were fantastic and our ability to um, fight as a, as a platoon, communicate. Um, I, I was really comfortable with wheeling and dealing assets, you know, particularly... Um, half on versus half off so a lot of tactics used to be like to helo assault force off and then try and do a clandestine sort of walk in whereas i was adamant that you know in afghanistan you just it's so hard to try and achieve particularly with a platoon force there's a dog here or there's just a random dude out there and the ability to get compromised and expose yourself to risk and then also the fact that there were so many targets lining up for us to hit I just really went down a heavy line of operations whereby uh, i worked extensively with the u.s um helo uh, call signs, assets, their, their planning staff, their operation staff, and really started to develop um, some SOPs that had us landing as close as we could to these compounds um, with proper force risk mitigations uh, and then just the way we conducted our operations to really turn and burn in, you know, a couple of hours as opposed to spending a couple of days on target type uh, No stuff. sneaky Pete, just get in there, get it done. Yeah, get in there, get it done. And, you know, there was extensive planning on the back. Each mission... You know, we had to brief helicopter crews five days out, had to brief ISR assets three days out. Um, there was so much planning and I had a, all of my team commanders and even some of the other guys who were just great with their individual thoughts. I always brought into our collective planning sessions. Like I had a whole planning staff, you know. I was the guy who had to, you know, sign off on the mission at the end and then go and out and lead it on the ground. But, it, it, you know, it was a huge staff planning process and I had amazing team commanders sitting there planning their individual elements and I put it together in the platoon con ops and um, it was absolutely fantastic and we got to do that like nearly every second day uh, and got to do it with, you know, the finger of God supporting us from above with all the assets that we had on hand and um, watching the guys go out there and do that so often without ever fearing for their own lives not in any form of cowboy heroism, but just for the fact that we had a job to do. We trusted each other so much and we were more fearful of letting each other down and failing the mission than we were of our own lives. Um, And it's just, it's so hard to explain. And I've gone back and had so many conversations with the guys um, since then, particularly in the last year, talking about that. Just being at that level where you literally don't really, it's not that you don't care for your own life, it's just not a factor in your head. And you're so focused and driven to what you're doing. Um, It's just such a euphoric place to think about in hindsight. Whereas at the time, you know, again, coming in on some dodgy helicopter insertions, um, you know, being full browned out and hitting the ground before the pilot thought it was going to hit the ground. And, you know, it was just like shit. You know, my head's thinking, right, if we roll over, this is what we need to do. Right, if if we're facing in the wrong direction, this is where... Like, the head was just always on the job on the mission. Whereas... Nowadays, I'll take off from Sydney Airport and hit a little bit of turbulence and I'm like saying prayers and holding onto the seat. It's just fascinating where like my mindset was back then compared to now. But you had built yourself up to that over years of training, yeah. all of you sharpening yourself to be that tip of the spear as it were. Yeah. 
And you describe that euphoric, almost kind of flow state in high performance, yeah. but also your responsibility as a leader, you've got your monitoring metric, performance metrics of yourself as a commando, yourself yeah. as a captain, and looking down at the troops under you from the NCOs to the regular shooters and so on. You're having to juggle so many different balls at once. How did you find just that day-to-day -day constant command requirement and responsibility? Well, I loved it. And my my entire life was my my job um you know even back home in barracks and personal life you know i i worked i sometimes went out with mates on the weekends but everything everything was geared towards my work i never had a, a relationship i never had a dog i never had anything that ever got in the way of me being the best at my job and again that was sort of the short-term um not sacrifice but decisions i made because you know i wasn't going to be a platoon commander forever you know i achieved what i wanted to do in being there and now i had this huge responsibility and I needed to do it to my absolute best because, you know, this was real life and death shit. This was real, um, you know, the, the responsibility of being a, a special forces member of a, the Australian Defence Force, let alone the missions and tasks we were given, let alone the responsibility I had to perform for my guys because we were going to do real world dangerous shit. Um, I took very, very personally and professionally and I aligned everything in my life towards it. Um, and again, it was a phase and it's nothing I would have changed. And it was, again, a phase that took me to being my personal and professional greatest. Well, later on, we'll get to your transition when you finally leave the service. But the other transition I'm interested in is that first time you come home from that major operational deployment, you've yep. been in that high euphoric state, that flow state and fulfilling this dream. And then what's it like your first day, week, month when you're back in Australia? Oh, uh, like it was, a, it was a lot. So... The end of that trip, uh, there was a lot going on, you know, from where to send a platoon back early to not stay and do the winter rotation, um, which were, was my platoon, because I was due to then rotate on to being the company XO, and we then had to take over um, contingency or advanced force operations, you know, op basically conducting international engagements and training in the Asia-Pacific region, and I didn't want to leave my platoon. You know, again, like that deployment was so amazing. I wanted to stay on another year and be a platoon commander. I wrote a letter to the new oncoming commanding officer just saying how I really, really wanted to. You know, and again, I was still so young at this time in comparison to some of the older guys. Um, and I understand there needed to be a career progression. But I, you know, literally kicking and screaming, wrote these letters and had conversations with my CEO. And nah, the decision was made. And my Peter Pan syndrome got a good smack in the face. But uh, also we'd lost Scott Smith. Um, Scott was one of the absolutely best soldiers I've ever served with and we lost him um, in October. Uh, and we rotated out uh, early December. And upon return, uh, the day after we got back to Sydney, we organised um, Scott's mum and his sister came to Sydney. Uh, I'd never met them before. Most of the guys hadn't met them before. But we met her and went to the North Bondi RSL and just had a meal with her and caught up with her. And, uh, you know, we'd, we'd done our own. Um, Scott died on the second day of a mission in Hellman. We had another day, another 48 hours out there. And then when we got back, we did the ramp ceremony and all that. But we never really got the chance to, you know, probably connect and farewell because the tempo was so high. So getting back... Um, and meeting Scott's mum and meeting his sister was, you know, a, a very big transition, you know, sitting there out look, looking over Bondi um, with the mother and sister of someone that, you know, I felt a bit of a personal responsibility there as well. And then, so Scott's funeral had been conducted while well, obviously we were over there, but um, they wanted to spread it. We're going to have a, 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 a ceremony to spread his ashes. So we then, most of the members, or a majority of the members of the platoon then travelled um, down to uh, where were they going to do that. So we spent about three days together. And, you know, that was a, a really special time as, as far as, again, coming together as a platoon and going through that um, official process. Uh, and we're briefly having Copper join us for the show. Yeah, Copper's going to sit here and be a good boy, aren't you? So, yeah. so that, was, um, that, was, that was quite the process. You know, and then after I did that, then I went back to my family, um, my mum's place in Brizzy. Uh, and it was very surreal. <laughs> uh, you know, there wasn't, it's not like a, you know, coming down from that and, you know, jumping at shadows and all this. I was very fortunate, you know, that again, the majority of my time over there was flying in helicopters. You know, that was my way of bypassing all of the IED risks and threats and all that that came along. So, you know, I didn't, I didn't look at stuff on the roadside and, 
you know, Twitch and do all that. But uh, it was boring being back. It was so boring being back. Having said that, like, I was tired. You know, we worked so hard over there. Um, it was kind of emotional also realising that I wasn't going to be in charge of the, or have the cha- platoon anymore. And I remember working through those emotions um, and really disappointed. It really made me actually question if I still wanted to um, stay or what I wanted to do next. You know, I'd been a commander, platoon commander. It's like now I guess I have to refocus and start the career piece to try and then come back and be a company commander and looking at that, you know, my head's always planning what's next. But then I came back um, to the unit at the start of 2013 as the company XO. And I actually had a really good new OC. And he was like, hey, look, man, I know you didn't want (laughs) to do this, but uh, I really need you to be a lot more hands-on, particularly with the guys. You know, I want you to really help me um, run and support the company down and through while I really focus on up and out. He was a really, really smart guy. He'd actually been a JTAC and then transferred over um, to what was called CADA. Uh, and he was like big brain concept. You know, we had been given the role to uh, basically engage with Asia Pacific, maintain these uh, deployable capabilities like parachute load follows and our ability to force project essentially from Sydney or from Australia anywhere into wherever we needed to the Asia Pacific. And there was a lot of really th- creative things we needed to do and including, you know, helping to work with the Navy and Air Force on some of their um, deployable capabilities and he was really focused on that and really let me get my hands on um, in the XO side and what I didn't realise is Company XO actually had a lot more um, ability to actually better support the guys even if that was like administratively or just making sure they weren't, they were resourced better and all that and again in hindsight it was such a key lesson learnt for me that I actually really loved my time as XO because it gave me the opportunity to have more authority to better support my guys and then I wasn't just responsible for my platoon I was then responsible for for the other platoon and all the guys in the company and it was really great to actually get me out of my box and really be able to put my rank and my authority into use to better support the guys you know particularly when you're a platoon commander it was very easy to like you know be pissed off at some of the decisions made above you Um, and then finally I had some influence some better influence over those decisions and made sure that they didn't happen again so Plus, I just spent that year travelling around Asia Pacific. It was absolutely fantastic, yeah. Can you walk me through your career timeline, I guess, then, for the next few years? What roles do you take? Uh, Yeah, so end of 2013, I then became adjutant to commando, um, which was fantastic uh, because I had particularly some key projects on, you know, really bringing together the other captains and the junior officers um, in more of a leadership role and implementing projects like the, um, what do we call it, the Commando Prospect, you know, basically doing more as far as opening up uh, the education understanding to wider army and potential younger officers who wanted to then do commando selection. Because I remember myself, you know, you outside of Special Forces, you just sort of hear, you only get to hear the stories and do whatever, whereas we started organising actually getting guys and girls in and doing trips and having them come to the unit and, you know, showing them what you actually do day to day as an officer in the unit. You know, everyone knows about the operations, knows about the deployments, knows about this. It's like, hey, what do you actually do day to day? And you can imagine that's just uh, the huge unknown and uncertainty. And it was just help breaking down uncertainty with education and understanding. So that was so much fun. And then, you know, at that time, we had everything from the deployment to Okra stepped up, uh, which was combating ISIS um, in Iraq. You know, the first deployment happened there. And up to Brisbane, supporting the G20. Um, you know, every single thing that the unit was involved in, I was involved with as the, as the adjutant. Um, and, you know, even one of my first things was the awarding of the Victoria Cross to Cam Baird. Um, the Australian story on Cam Baird, you know, I was the guy behind the scenes working with that. You know, my year as adjutant was fantastic, just having variety left, right and centre. Um, and then at the end of that, uh, I went over to the US for a, depo- for a one year exchange 2015 so that was with the 75th Ranger Regiment um, and that was my last year as a, as a captain Can we jump back to Okra so do you yep. deploy there as the adjutant? No so I didn't I was actually <laughs> I was actually in uh, doing my COAC course I was in Canungra when uh, my commanding officer uh, took off uh, with the first deployment over there I was actually extremely jaded by that because we'd been messaging and I'd always wanted to get to Iraq. I've always had this, um, not 
fantasy, but as in like you know uh, the the history behind Iraq. You know, even my dad. Deep ancient history. Yeah, exa- cradle exactly. civilization. Exactly. You know, like the start of civilization. You know, my dad had actually been deployed to Iraq, and you know, I thought I'd missed out on Iraq. You know, when I was at when I was. You'll at get there in 2017, but we'll come to yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. Be a good boy, copper. Yeah, mm. we'll see how he goes. But yeah, so then, um, you know, I was I was his adjutant, and I was his you know right hand man as far as the junior officers went, but. Just the, the timing happened and he got so focused on it that he actually deployed and literally, you know, I got a message from someone else saying, oh, the CEO's on his way to the airport. I was like, hey, boss, you said you were going to take me. He's like, oh, sorry, mate. You know, everything happened too fast. I had to put someone else on the IMD. I was pissed off. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> but, yeah, and he had a new CEO come in um, who was absolutely fantastic, uh, Garth, and really got to forge a new relationship. You can imagine you have to forge, like, a brand-new command relationship there and... Um, he, re- again, really empowered me to get a lot more involved with things like the G20 and with helping to support everything else that needed to be run back um, at home while we particularly had our element forward forging the first deployment over there. You can imagine there's a lot that needs to occur. It's very easy to jump something over there, but then it's actually then putting together the pieces behind it um, and still maintaining all the other operational capability requirements we had to as a unit. So. Again, it was, it was a fantastic personal and professional progression for me as, again, my eyes and ears just got opened up wider and wider and wider and, you know, get to see all of the internal and external working surrounding not only two commander but the wider special forces and special operations command and particularly in that role I had to really um, engage a lot more with all the other units in special forces as well. So from SASR to the engineer regiment and particularly up to special operations headquarters and then a lot of the other government assets and things like that uh, assets and agencies I really had to be that guy plugging into and I was a lot of the time the LO or the lead planner or whatever that was put into those elements to do that it was very cool yeah your career really actually showcases the variety of roles and yeah. exciting places and different places you can get to so are you promoted to major in 2015 so I end of so I spent that year in the US um, I spent uh, it was about seven months uh, based in um, Fort Benning, Columbus, Georgia, and then deployed with their Task Force 7 to back to Afghanistan for the latter part of 2015. Embedded and within them, okay. Yeah, so I was the only Aussie embedded within them. And that was awesome deployment. It was really... That's the one deployment I'm really not allowed to say much about just because the US is so... I, I understand, yeah. I understand, don't worry. But it was fascinating for me, and this is probably where the first little seed of awareness slash doubt creeps in is when I just really got to see how I say the big boys did it. Yep. You know, the big boys do it. With all know. their resources, all the might of the... Yeah, and even just the acceptance of risk, uh, you yep. know. Particularly, you know, in Afghanistan, I got to get away with, like, doing a lot of stuff from, like, the, the assets we had on station through to just how much um, trust we had in some of the profiles that we did as far as, like, mission planning. Um, but then... And there were always those risk aversions, like anything near the border of Pakistan and all these sort of things. And then I got over there to the US and it was just like, oh, you know, the colonel just turns to the Department of State. He's like, hey, you're going to need to start picking up the phone and calling people, <laughs> you know, other countries. Um, they just, they really just owned that risk. They definitely understood it. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't cowboy stuff. It was just knowing and understanding the risk, but accepting that risk, which I really saw. And we can talk about it more about, you know, just how, much, how risk adverse some of our guys get, and particularly our, our nation, national military decision makers get, you know, for that fear of it coming back on them. Like, these guys just owned it, and they just did it. And they had the muscle and the might. It was all theirs. They weren't relying on other people's resources. It was just fascinating to see it really played out in action. And, you know, and they'd done it so many times. I want to jump ahead to 2017, but before I do, I'll ask one question I think you can answer about this deployment mm-hmm. in that how did you, I guess, reflect on your, at the time, or in hindsight, either way, your performance there and how you'd grown as an operator, as a leader, and all those different aspects from your f- first combat deployment to Afghanistan? Could you see that growth and difference within you in those years? Yeah, really huge. I mean, particularly, I mean, it, it's very handy being like the only Aussie with the US <laughs> and again, sort of being being fit and likeable as well as being good at your job and all those sort of things. It was finally being able to put that all together and, you know, carry that responsibility of being the best representative of not only my my country but my command and my unit and all that. But, you know, I found myself being able to 
sit there and engage with them to talk about, you know, operational planning and mission profiles through to then actually talking with the younger company commanders and all that about tactics and actions on the ground and how we'd use some of our assets with the helos and some of those profiles that adapted in 2012 and to some of the profiles that could be used over there. So it was really fascinating, you know, being able to yeah, be useful across every aspect, essentially. Um, and yeah, again, being able to do so with an Aussie accent was even easier to cut through. And talk about drop bears, mate, and the usual drop shenanigans. Coming at you with a, a knife. Say it, say it. That's not a knife. Yeah, all the time. Yeah, All the cliches. Yeah. yeah. Um, tell me about 2017. 2017, what happened in 2017? 2017? Did you go to Iraq in 2017? Oh, yeah, sorry. So what did it, I came back from the US, took up the... Uh, I was the chief instructor and OC of the, um, what, was it, what was it called? Training wing. Training wing at the Special Forces Training Centre. So we uh, ran the Special Forces Selection Course, the Commando Selection Course, and then the Rio. Um, and that was at a time where we were just required to readapt it to um, focus less on kind of selecting specific for operations in Afghanistan, which was sort of the ultimate end state. That's the highest level of risk. And include and still achieve that, but then include a lot more uh, like emotional quotient and personality testing and behavioural testing and really utilising a lot of what I've used, particularly in the representational roles from jumping around Asia Pacific 2013 to embedding with all the other agencies 2014 in Azad just to being over there in the US with all that sort of stuff and bring like, you know, helping to how do we better select people who will be able to match those character profiles, not just the high-end warfighting profiles. And that was so fascinating. That's where I said that was that bookend that really helped me realise and unlock and draw a lot of pathways back through not only my selection but my entire career and helped me better understand emotional intelligence in general. Um, but, yeah, then jumping forward to the latter part of 2016, I managed to uh, be selected for a position to go over as the... J5, so the Special Operations J5 within the Sagittus Special Operations Joint Task Force Operation Inherent Resolve. So, long story short, that's a the the the, the, the larger US Special Forces headquarters that sat over uh, Iraq and Syria, and I was in the Iraq detachment, and I was the only Aussie apart from the commander who was um, Finlay at that time, and then came back to be Sokost, and I was the the J5, so I was the plans officer, and it was so. Personally, it was so satisfying being in Iraq, but also so satisfying actually being able to contribute to the fight against ISIS. And this is in the context of, um, just for listener clarification, Battle for Mosul, and this is when it started to really yeah. come to a head. Yeah, so when we got there, you know, Mosul was really... This, this bloody drone. Anyway, you're right, you missed it. Oh, I missed it. Yeah, there's been this bloody the drone. The camera might have caught it. We'll yeah, find out later. There's been this bloody drone blown, drone zooming around. It's also been pervert on me. There's been some baking out here. It's, uh, literally, it's been a funny thing with the building manager. But um, yeah, Mosul was in full swing. Uh, you know, in, from my time as adjutant, you know, from missing out on being deployed to Iraq, uh, but watching what was the true manifestation of, like, evil in the modern-day world. You know, we got to see how terrible these people were that we were facing um, you know, you, the, from the beheadings through to, you know, watching that pilot being burned alive and, you know, just what they were doing to the local population. There was no greater purpose than to take the fight to these people and support those who couldn't be. And I finally got the ability to do that. Um, and I did that as, as a planner um, where, again, I was playing with, like, the big boys. You know, nothing that I did, the, the basic remit of my role was nothing I did was any closer than three months out. Most of it was six months out. It was like big high-level planning and it was fantastic and it really helped me appreciate the, the clarity and headspace needed in order to be able to achieve such things. You know, most of the time we're, we're solving problems every day. You know, those everyday spot fires that you're very good at. But I had the ability to not have to worry about everyday spot fires and actually sit down and again with a great planning team. I had... Um, a US fighter pilot, I had a SAMS graduate, I had all these other guys in there and actually go into deliberate detail and planning like some big stuff that I, can, I can't really talk about. But um, That's fine. Then en engaging with the US Department of State, you know, preparing briefs for Donald Trump, um, really, really high level stuff that was, you know, working with the Peshmerga and how we were doing that. Uh, it was some big hands, little map stuff, but I, as a part of my role, 
then also had the freedom to actually go out to these elements and really engage with them. And, you know, we were literally, it's about rebuilding a country after this sort of stuff and, you know, what's next? I, did, I didn't even touch Mosul. It's like, what is after Mosul and what are the contingency plans that need to occur depending upon how Mosul goes um, within all the other coalitions? And, uh, yeah, it was, it was awesome. But it was also a very interesting time whereby I was required to really harness every ounce of um, intelligence and experience I had, but there was no like physical application of my skill sets. <laughs> I had to carry a rifle around with me, and um, it was it was like a decoration or an accessory. Or yeah, what? I really felt, you know, that you finally become a staff officer, <laughs> and it wasn't it wasn't a nice feeling. I love the fact that I was able to do what I could do, um, and uh, by all accounts, I, I did very good in that role. And again. It was also probably that second time where I really got to see the difference between uh, the appetite for risk, let alone opportunity of the Australian government, again, versus particularly the US and other coalitions. You know, I would go across the road. I was based in the Green Zone. I would go across the road to the US embassy and, you know, we'd be conducting discussions with, you know, out of uniform, um, all dressed up and conducting discussions on where we're going to support Iraq in procuring their next lot of... You know, military hardware, you know, who they were going to get their drones from, you know, all this like big level stuff. And then I come back and I have this request from the US, uh, sorry, from the Australian special operations elements, like, hey, we need to get a Bushmaster sent over from Australia, but we have to paint it because the government doesn't want DPCU colours to be seen out of the wire. And it's just like, this is pathetic, you know, um, in the grand scheme of things. You know, we're, there's like, we're, we're, liberating, we're helping liberate a country and fight evil and do all this and our guys could be doing so much more but even at this time in Mosul, there was, the guys were up there fighting in Mosul with their dudes and then a couple of the US Special Forces guys got killed and next thing the rules came back is you have to be one tactical bound back from the guys, you know, you, and then you have to be outside the city limits and the role we had was, you know, advise assist you're out there with the dudes on the ground and anyone who's ever been in any form of combat leadership themselves like you have to be there with the guys you know you definitely have to um, look after yourself and your team but trying to mentor these partner force the ctu they were fighting their asses off and they were the best as far as taking ground and actually taking the fight to isis in mosul and they just carry so much of the burden and so much of the fighting power with them and they lost so many guys but they were incredible and then you're telling our guys that they have to like step back from actually supporting them. Um, you you not only erode the legitimacy of yourself to perform that role, you start to like emasculate our guys um, from supporting those who are taking the casualties, and you actually put more uh, mental and emotional wedges in um, not only your people but the people you're supporting. And it was really disheartening to watch that. That it, you know there wasn't even even logic behind it. It wasn't actually safer back here, you know, because you're having these random suicide. IED cars and by then um, during that time in 2016 they started um, weaponizing like little remote drones they started attaching the 40 mil grenades to them and they were just flying them over and literally dropping you know from your little tiny gyrocopter drones um, you know, it's, it sounds like arbitrary political decision making that does c totally clashes with uh, what you were describing about special forces we make practical decisions as opposed to the hands in pockets kind of rules and that's like it and all these some of these decisions that were being made weren't even being made um in order to with with the insights of supporting our guys safely on the ground it was just someone's like hey look this is the rule you know as opposed to listening to the people on the ground and what's actually needed to achieve your mission it's like hey no the, the mission here is not to um, expose our guys to more risk than we need to as opposed to the results and actions on the ground. So that really started to erode at me even further. Um, at the same time, the general that I was working with, um, I'd come from all that entire career, as I said beforehand, uh, in particularly two commando and then even running the selection course. Um, and I really looked forward to the opportunity to let him know my perspective um, and my experience um, and even particularly on the, on the selection course. So the key thing to note with the selection course is Everyone tries to change it every single year. Everyone comes in with their own philosophies. And we'd really done such a huge body of work bringing in all forms of external support, you know, female, female psychologists, psychiatrists, working with AIS, all these sorts of things. And I really look forward to briefing him on that. And, you know, all I sort of got was the, you know, I know boats. He was a troop commander in SAS way back in the day. I know boats. Um, I, look forward to, I look forward to watching two commando putting a battalion out on the parachute uh, out on a parachute jump because that's what they said they could do when they took it over from three hour 
Um, you know, just these irrelevant conversations that clearly demonstrated one, had no knowledge of the current capability and two, didn't care. Um, so that was sort of the final key piece that was really eroding me further whereby um, I was becoming a little bit disillusioned in our appetite to actually accept the required, not only risk, but opportunities to achieve the actual mission. It came down to public opinion and reporting back to Australia um, and making sure that we weren't getting people killed or injured, regardless of the fact that we were letting people down and, and causing more mental and emotional injuries in doing so to our actual guys, through to um, you know a, a leader that I couldn't follow and believe in. Um, and then... Uh, you know, likely moving back because they were saying that my time at SFTC had qualified as subunit command. Um, they wanted me to try and get down to Canberra to staff college as soon as possible because we were having a great sort shortage of senior majors and lieutenant colonels and all that within um, special forces, which, as you can imagine, you've heard from me say before, was just moving further and further and further away from leading and commanding soldiers. Well, I wanted to ask about that in that in the first part of your answer, you describe... A, what sounds like a really fascinating job, that deep kind of big picture planning. Yeah, I loved it. And compare that to any other kind of line of work, your first big leadership role with your platoon um, in 2012, five years, four and a half, five years later, you're in this massive scale. Like in any corporate sense, that's quite a fast sort of promotion track. I know the military scales differently, but yeah. it's a huge role change. I can, hence how, I can sense how, you know, enraptured you were by this role, yeah. but also were you kind of itching, I also want to go out there with the guys. Yeah, I mean, I'm also, uh, I'm a very quick learner. Um, I'm not the smartest person, but I'm very good at learning things very quickly. And I'm also a very lazy person when it comes down to it. So I can actually readily uh, self-assess where I'm actually best used. And to be honest, at this time, you know, one thing that also I absolutely hated, particularly in my time in Afghanistan, was people who just wanted to come out on a mission. You know, particularly other officers who wanted to come out on a mission. Just for uh, it, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It, it's like that's entitlement. That's not responsibility. I absolutely hate it. Um, and also because that's putting additional responsibility on someone else. Like, you know, if you, unless you've actually been training within that platoon, we all definitely have a great basic level of skill sets. But there's no point like overcomplicating things and exposing them yourself and others to excessive risk and, you know, going out there and chasing battles. I'd had my battles in 2012. Um, other people could do that job now. Other people couldn't do the job that I needed to do there. So I'm very good at doing the job that usually only I can do or I can do better in that job. Um, so it was very easy for me to do that. And I definitely went down and engaged with the um, two commando guys, the um, Australian so command guys, even the US guys. And, you know, there's definitely plenty of offers to go out on trips with them. And I went out and had a look here and there. But, like, that wasn't my job. It was very important to go out there and have a look on the ground and make sure I wasn't sitting in an ivory tower and just planning you know, great big hands, little maps. You had to go down and constantly validate and um, work through and validate or, or, or remove any of the assumptions. But um, it's just re appreciating like what your job is. And the worst thing you do is go and try and chase glory. Um, yeah, if you're meant to have glory, you'll, you'll, you'll find it. And the best thing you can do is just be good at your job and be a good person and allow it to come along. So, um, yeah, that's my little rant on that. Fair enough. Well, when you're faced with the staff college option, what do you decide to do? Uh, well, I had, by this time, like I said to you before, and I just threw myself into my work and everything. And I actually had, um, I think, about 112 days worth of leave in my book by the time I got back from my deployment um, early 2017. And I also had my long service leave. Uh, and during my time in the US, actually in 2015, I actually had a lot of downtime. Um, the US has so many public holidays and they usually uh, would change it so as you'd have a lot of long weekends and things like that. Um, and I actually had a lot more of a social life in the US than I ever did um, back in Australia. And I actually started to date someone in the US um, 2016 because I would go back there um, during what time I had. Uh, and it was a man, so I was um, in the closet the whole time because being gay didn't align with me personally, let alone the culture I was within. So is that self-denial, not just self-protection? Um, I don't know. I've never had to think about it in that terms. Being, I, didn't, I didn't like being gay. I didn't want to be gay. I wanted to change being gay. I saw it as weakness. No one else in my unit of... 400 special forces operators and 400 support staff was openly gay. And at this time, I was a major, you know, the second highest rank. Um, and I 
didn't want anyone to look at me differently. I didn't want anyone, even at this time, to, you know, the gay marriage vote happened in 2015 while I was in the US. You know, I watched the nation be divided over it. I didn't want any of that to be in a factor because I was good at my job um, and I needed to be good at my job and maintain being good at my job every single day. And I didn't want anyone even looking at me to give me any form of special treatment. You know, I just didn't want it to be relevant. I didn't want the dudes looking at the boss and saying, oh, is he doodle snooping us in the shower or shit like this? It was all in my own head. And being gay didn't weigh up against my personal values. You know, it was just, it was selfish. Like, I didn't need to be gay because it was... It was it detracted from my job personally and it felt selfish. But anyway, as all those other factors like I talk about on that deployment to Iraq, you know, those little seeds of doubt start sowing in. I was actually sort of dating um, this guy for nearly two years by the time I was in Iraq. Uh, and that's what I actually learned. Because I had so much time to think, particularly long scale in my, in my job, FOMO, fear of missing out, is real. And at the same time, you know, between 2012 to 2015... Um, social media, you know, Snapchat and all the ability to be so readily connected with what someone is doing. Um, you know, every evening I'd go back to my phone, which was obviously back at the secure area and see like normal life going on and how I could be a part of that. So long story short, I got from that tr- back from that trip and decided to take the majority of my leave um, to figure my life out. And I actually went over to the US um, to be with him. And I, as we do, rapidly transitioned into a new life and um, continued on my leave, but during that time, put up, put in my discharge application, and I never, I never served another proper day, um, and discharged at the 24th of January 2019. So I had a lot of leave in my book, and took it at half pay, and I went back to the unit a couple of times to hand in things and tick boxes, but effectively done. Yeah, that was pretty much it. Well, Heston, I cited in the introduction like, some of your great achievement bringing Barry's boot camp to Australia, yeah. and so you clearly found a new professional outlet to focus on and we know you're an incredibly hard worker so I can see you jumping, finding the next thing, you're planning steps ahead and going, okay, what's my next thing? Fitness, this. I'm just making guesses here. Yeah. Can you tell me about your transition from your last day in the unit, both in that professional sense yeah. and then that personal sense? Well, I first came across Barry's actually when I went to the US 2015. In 2014, I actually snapped to my patella tendon. Um, as I was adjutant, and my first ever time running back was on a Barry's treadmill, as cliche it was in LA. And um, the guy I ended up dating, Blake, was actually a trainer at Barry's. And Barry's, again, was just this, you know, they wanted to do this international franchising. And again, I was fantastic at um, means to an end, putting things together, uh, very good at projects and p- building people and culture. And, you know, Bar- Barry's was basically putting all that to the test and also providing me with a vessel through which I could move my partner to Australia, establish a business and live happily ever after. Uh, so that's what that was, you know. It was, a, it was a lot of planning and then leading the expansion here and it was so fun, you know. I, I'm not a personal trainer. I, I enjoyed it from the fitness, but I also enjoyed it from the community. It brought together people who were so focused on fitness and the opportunities with Barry's, particularly in the Australian fitness market, was to bring people up to the level of um, the level that I think that they should have been at, that they deserve to be at. You know, particularly for price point and everything like that. You know, so anyway, long story short, managed to partner with the people who own Fitness First and all that. They called Fitness and Lifestyle Group, and you know, agree to be the lead to expand it here. And you know, we're building three and a half million dollar fitness studios, three of them here in Sydney, one in Singapore, and really bringing and elevating the experience up while focusing on the core brand. At the same time, you know, I got to do things like convert a warehouse down near the airport into a training and selection facility where we had a couple of hundred trainers go through and do a selection process for them through to personally selecting all the staff in the studios and doing like our own cultural onboarding. And, you know, I was building my own family, um, which is what I needed, particularly jumping out of defence. And I was doing everything from hand-picking every single fixture and finishing through to organising training and selection processes through to jumping into marketing, retail, all this sort of stuff and just filling my life with every ounce of it. But in true form, I just immersed myself in it and I immersed myself too headlong and at the same time didn't fully appreciate that I just jumped out of one of the largest not-for-profit organisations, purpose-focused organisations essentially in the the military and jumped headlong into a huge... um, commercial life you know you went from vocation to corporation yeah that's it it was you know having to justify profit and loss statements and you know there's no there's no line in the spreadsheet that says culture (laughs) 
So when you're trying to brief up to the big boys, the reasons why you're doing some of these things and spending some of the extra money and really focusing on people being happy doing what they're doing um, when they were in a, in a glide path to try and look to sell the whole business at the top. You know, we just had these big personal culture clashes and that ended up with me leaving. <laughs> yeah. Leaving aside that professional journey, I guess, yep. though, you know, you had this commando dream from when you were a teenager yep. and it was your purpose. It was then what your identity was. And yep. what you, it was, I can, I can gather from this conversation, a key defining feature of who you were. And then, yes, you'd been jaded as those latter stages and aspects of your career. Yep. But then still, you are leaving that big family. You've lost that part of who you are. You are now X and you've lost the immediate access to that tribe, as it were. Yeah. And then the Barry thing goes so far and then you also kind of leave that corporate tribe in a way. Yeah. How did you find that experience? Well, I mean, that's the, the key thing about being a commando and I still love like the phrase commando and it's something that I try and hold myself to, you know, unconventional. You know, remember we had to like study... Um, for basically like this, the, the, uh, one of the tests at the start of the course, you know, you just basically have to do this pop quiz test. And there are all these definitions you'd, you know, you'd spend all your time studying for. It's unconventional, not bound by or conforming to convention, precedent or rule. And one thing I loved about then throughout the commando career and then even what we were training and selecting the guys on towards the end of it was selecting and training the right person to be ready for anything, you know. You select the right person and specially equip them, especially train them, to then be able to put on or help them to achieve whatever is needed next for whatever mission turns up. But the, you, you, you know, you're sitting there ready to pivot in position or whatever your life needs to be. And that's what I prided myself in doing and very able to rapidly transition to the next thing. Um, but in doing so, what I would then do is completely move on. So, you know, when I jumped into um, being in a relationship and being Barry's, you know, I immediately thought that the easiest thing, because it was so polar opposite, you know, there was even like a bit of a media profile with that, which was so polar opposite to everything within the Special Forces and was even like a point of discomfort personally, let alone professionally. I just completely moved on and isolated. I isolated myself from my community, from my tribe, because I thought it was the best thing for my, my community and my tribe, not to primarily for myself, but for, you know, not wanting to be seen to be milking the commando name and things like that. And it was actually some of the worst things I could have done because what I did was I removed myself from that those people who knew me at, at my best, who, who knew what I truly valued, who knew what I truly needed to be the best version of me. Um, I removed myself from my team, my support network, um, all those people who were naturally inclined to look out for me and surrounded myself with people who instead were looking out for what I could do for them. Um, it was, I really did not set myself out for transition well. I applied my absolute skill sets in being able to rapidly assimilate myself to a new surrounding and throw myself into, uh, in a very selfless way, everything that I could do to achieve greatness for others and myself in doing so. But it was, it was, it was a spiral in the wrong direction. We took a quick break there to yeah. relight things because I didn't anticipate, or I should have anticipated how much good content I'd be getting from Heston. So this chat's going a tad over. Thank you for bearing with us, mate. That's right. I asked about your mental health journey and transition journey mm. there because you've become very outspoken with Voice of a Veteran and all the very public events over the last nine, 12 months about the impact certain events in publicised in the media are having on the veteran community and I know you reached a real low point last year in 2020 when someone took their life and so can you talk to me more about just not more about how you pivoted yourself out of your own mental health journey than where you found yourself and then how you found yourself being pulled back into speaking out for this tribe yeah for sure well so even yeah particularly during that time and during my own transition you know from 2017 when I came back uh, the Burton inquiry or the IGADF inquiry um, was underway and you sort of heard murmurings of it and some guys had been required to go in and give evidence and we didn't really know too much about it. There was a bit of a general brief on it but all that you knew is when these guys had gone and had their brief, they couldn't talk about it and it was really fascinating because the community we were already in already had was self-isolated from the rest of the Defence Force. You know, we weren't even allowed to 
wear our uniforms off base and all that sort of stuff. Uh, you didn't tell people, you weren't allowed to tell people you were in the Defence Force. You know, we all had our own little made-up cover stories and whatever. And then all of a sudden, within that community, you start seeing people being isolated within that community. And, you know, st- there was this, this, this doubt and this uncertainty starting to creep in. It's like, well, what's going on? Um, people were being threatened with court-martials if they spoke about it and blah, blah, blah. And then it really started to see uh, some ripples of... Also, the, the, the impacts of drawing down from um, our time in Afghanistan, you know. For some people, again, like myself, it was the absolute highlight of our career, but for, for some guys, um, particularly as the unit had to, and the command had to rapidly transition, um, some of their personality types didn't really match what we needed to be in the future. You know, and it's, that's nothing against them. It's, you know, some people had spent their whole lives doing that. Um, and some of them found themselves really struggling to keep up with where the unit and the command had to pivot to and... You know, we started to see some of our older, more experienced guys dropping off and, you know, some guys struggling with just even assimilating back into normal life and not rotating overseas every year. And it was just, yeah, this bit of a a ripple uh, through what was otherwise a a very um, well-maintained and well-cohesive and and, and, and energising community. And, you know, then some suicides started to pop up, um, which was just incredible to understand all that some of these guys have been through, you know, and I, again, just, like, pivot back to my own highest risk experiences in some of those missions in 2012, you know, the cliche staring down death, you know, some of these guys were were warriors, you know, they had literally um, stared down death and been in situations, you know, it's not just once, it's, you know, 50 times, but yet somehow managed to get to the mental health point whereby that, they convinced themselves they had to kill themselves, and they did so. Um, it, it was incredible. Um, at the same time, during my time, uh, this time I'd left Barry's and I'd, I'd been unable to find a job. You know, uh, I had to swallow my pride and started applying for the very low-level jobs. I didn't even know how to effectively do the application process. Um, you know, I had a fantastic resume, but I wasn't doing it right to make it digitally online. I wasn't answering the actual questions they wanted, and... Um, I went through my own sort of spiral and I was partying hard and doing all that sort of good stuff. And, yeah, August of last year, I, long story short, sat there on my couch, got a phone call about one of my guys who had um, tried to kill himself and it took me to a place whereby... Oh, sorry, also concurrent to this, I'd finally started working through my DVA paperwork. I didn't touch a single... Th- you know, even when I snapped my knee in 2014, I managed to never have it registered for a med downgrade and then all of a sudden... I saved that all up for after my discharge and started to put in my first claims and fully started to appreciate that this was a a process that only cared about uh, how to minimise the amount that they needed to pay me out or and maybe you know essentially justify uh, every single thing in order to try and pick holes and, and not provide liability on compensation for me and I didn't care about money I wanted to get like treatment at this time money had actually gotten worse um my fitness was probably at one of its lowest levels. Uh, and long story short, you know, 12 months later, I finally got in to see a doctor early 2020. And I took the same scan that the army made me get on my exit medical. And he looked at it and he looked at the report. It had been through about three doctors now for DVA to do the level of compensation and liability for me to then be allowed to go and see this doctor on a specialist appointment. And he just sat me down. And he's like, has anyone spoken to you about this report? Or this scan? He's like, no. He's like, well, this was taken 14 months ago. And it completely says here that you have, you know, this two centimetre piece of bone that's doing this and doing this, doing this. And any doctor who picked this up with the focus on how can I support the patient would have had you in here and I can do a 45 minute procedure to remove that two centimetre piece of bone and make you run again after the recovery period. But it's evident that all they've done is looked at this from, again, this compensation piece. Because no one's looked at it saying, how do we help him? It's like, hey, what does this justify with liability and compensation? And that was a huge light bulb moment for me because, like, like you know, I was in physical pain. You know, and I'd come from being so reliant on my physicality to really, um, you know, I was very proud at how fit and capable I was and it also helped me be better at my job. It was an early method used to prove yourself as yeah, well. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and then particularly with barriers and everything else in between, everything was so fitness focused. And then I was, you know, all of a sudden in the gay culture community, which is so superficial and fitness focused as well. And, you know, I was really getting a loss of identity to the fitness side of myself. And then I realised that, you know, I could have had something nearly 14 months ago that would have 
not help me spiral to this place that I was in. And I was, I was angry. I was so angry that I wasn't even valued enough to have um, the Veterans Affairs system look at something in a way of how can we support him as opposed to, uh, you know, what does this mean we have to do by the letter of the law and by the book? And that sort of eroded at my leadership culture because, you know, I've seen you beforehand about when I was like company XO and I had this newfound authority to actually support the guys and it, it, I was just ignorant thinking that people were actually looking out to how to support you, um, particularly when, you know, that's sort of the, the role and remit of them and it was, it, it just added another layer to me feeling really devalued and that my military service you know at this point i discharged at 16 years of service and not as a level of entitlement but just like a potential consideration that maybe you know special forces career all this sort of stuff someone might look at it and care <laughs> um and it's really uh, it's really sort of hurtful when you don't feel like someone cares about you well they just care more about how much money you're trying to get out of them and as i've subsequently going back and said to DVA it's never about money it's just make me feel like you actually care and want to help me anyway so that was the sort of point I was at mentally and emotionally and then I had my sort of trigger which was again sitting on my couch getting a phone conversation that one of the guys that I used to be responsible for uh, tried to kill himself you know tried to overdose himself with prescription medication this guy had a young child who was also there in the property and long story short um he hadn't been successful. Um, he was in hospital recovering uh, and he's fine to this day. But I finished that conversation and as my head does, uh, fantastic in planning and contingency planning, and I just really could not understand how this guy got to that point. So I just started going through my head and it's like I know he'd put some DVA stuff through and was really having some trials and tribulations with that and all the things that I'd experienced, I started to sort of map similar pathways into where he might have been. And then I started really thinking about my own transition process, how, you know, I was able to leave the military with two sessions worth of box ticking and an interview with someone who empathised with me and thanked me for my service but had no idea of what that even meant. Um, I didn't even have to have a psych exit interview. I somehow had a waiver. You know, it was, it was an admin stuff up, they've told me afterwards, but, you know, I'd... I'd been overseas, I'd personally killed people, I'd seen one of my best guys killed and I didn't even need to have a psych screening on the way out. Through to, I'd heard from no one during that period that I was on leave. You know, for that 18 month period I was away, I had some of my key friends, but like no one formally from defence kept tabs on me. I like had to chase through my own discharge paperwork like a maniac because they moved me into a pool position so they could open up that position for someone else to come in and provide effective service and, you know... It, it was just no one cared. As soon as you demonstrated you weren't going to provide capability anymore, you were just cut out in the breeze. And I actually appreciated that because I never wanted to be a liability on someone else. But all these things is like, look, if that can happen to me as a special forces major, you know, now I know why it's happening to the guys and girls under the age of 30, you know, who have been med discharged who have been through all this sort of things. You know, if, if I can't even feel valued um, given the um, presumption of entitlement that might be carried with that rank um, and I can't even navigate the DVA system, how are these guys meant to feel and how are these guys meant to be able to do that? So it took me to that place where I was like, right, well, what needs to be done about this? Um, and for that few minutes or moments or however long it was uh, on my couch, literally this couch here, I was like, right, you know, I need to kill myself. I need the newspapers to read, you know, Special Forces Commando Major kills himself, you know. I wrote out a very lengthy uh, email and explanation of all the things I told you about, particularly my transition process um, from not needing a psych screening through to, you know, even some of the stuff I said on that last exit pop interview from leaving country in Iraq uh, through to... All the oh, I saved all my DVA emails and everything. I just started making a whole file, and you know, I literally visualized like Jackie Lambie sitting up, uh, standing up in the parliament and reading out, you know, because she'd been very vocal about this and reading out, you know, this is what is going on. And I really thought that you know, me killing myself was going to be uh, the final step that was needed in order to do this. Um, and it's so fascinating for me to again go to that place in reflection. Uh, because I had previously really thought that suicide was something that was potentially predisposed. It was potentially something that people were, were born with or they had a bad childhood 
or they'd really suffered, you know, some proper PTSD, individual traumatic situations overseas that had like rewired their brain. But I mean, the I've, I've I've said the story enough times. You know, Copper came and put his head on my lap. It was time to feed him, and he snapped me out of it because all of a sudden I had to do something outside of myself. Something else needed me. And you saw the flaw in that line of thinking. Yeah, I um, well, it was so fascinating for me to appreciate that I literally thought it was the most logical thing to do. It wasn't, you know, I want sympathy or I want what, whatever. I, like, in my head, it was as clear as, like, planning a platoon mission. This is exactly what needs to occur. And it's not like, there's no, like, what ifs or buts or, or doubt. There was zero doubt in my head. And that was so scary for me to be so wholly and solely committed to um, thinking that that was what needed to be done. And then I was like, holy shit, like, I need to talk to someone about this. But at the same time, I was so uh, embarrassed. You know, at the same time, you know, I was a former special forces commando officer. I was Heston. You know, I prided myself. I pushed myself to standards, um, very, very high standards. And then, again, all of a sudden, I was like, whoa, you know, the ultimate weakness has creeped in, like you wanted to kill yourself, you know. What would your mother think? What would all this? And uh, it was really, really embarrassing, to be honest. But um, I actually just then, you know, called my mum. <laughs> When I lost Scott Smith overseas, when I came back from that mission, I came back, locked myself in my platoon room, uh, closed the door, and I called my mum. Um, uh, same thing when I finally decided that, yes, I was gay and I <laughs> couldn't change it. I actually went and saw my sister first, but then I sort of called my mum. It's funny, just we do default back to those support networks. And yeah. I didn't... Um, actually, no. I spoke to my sister. I did. I spoke to my sister and I called my mum. And I spoke to them both. I was just like, hey, like, this is what happened to me and I don't want you to be scared because now that I've gone there, again, I'm an incredibly fast learner um, and it felt kind of weird in me saying, it's like, hey, I went there and I'm not telling you this because I want sympathy. It was so enlightening and insightful for me uh, and it really sort of was an aha, hit the spark moment um, that, one, I need help. <laughs> I something's going on in my head and in my heart that is really leading me down thought processes that I shouldn't be and secondly uh, why am I sitting back writing these things and waiting other people to do them for me why am I handing over problems to other people um, why am I going back on everything I've been trained in my life to do which is find a way to solve any problem and be and build myself to be that person that is ready to solve any problem at any time um, and it just kicked me back into gear. Um, uh, yeah. Well, it's been a very public journey watching you <laughs> shortly after fighting for the veterans community on a number of fronts from the meritorious unit citation you're wearing. Thank you for acquiescing to our request on that. Yeah, that's all right. Um, well, even that, was, it, it was fascinating. And I'd, I'd really need to do a lot of more work to better outline this story because from there, uh, my key grievance was in particular how devalued I felt, particularly during that transition and DVA process. So I became very vocal about that, um, you know, and next thing, linked in with a friend of a friend and it was a front page article in the Telegraph, you know, me about the, the plight of veteran suicide and I jumped straight into that. And that was, um, well, that was end of September. Uh, and then I was very vocal and got very involved uh, with DVA. Uh, and You changed the narrative and bringing some of the stats about veteran suicide, which is something the community knows to an extent but bring it to the wider population yeah and it's so interesting particularly when you're in it when you're in the you you, you think it's actually just all assumed knowledge it's uh, not yeah and another key thing is people don't know what they don't know and we're terrible at actually um speaking up on things and it was having a purpose to speak up on it for and that purpose wasn't me that purpose was potentially my story can help people feel more uh, relevant and can actually just help educate. And it actually has been such an uncomfortable thing to really put it out there and, again, really tear down this picture-perfect image that I wanted, that I had of myself, to be honest. Um, and But in, at the same time, be empowering that it's actually not weakness, it's just vulnerability and we're all human. And the realisation was that every single, every single veteran uh, I've spoken to uh, about these topics tells me that they've had their own similar moment, they've had their own ideation. And that has just been so remarkable. Um, even asking them, like, why haven't you told anyone? It's like, well, you feel like something's wrong with you and we never want to accept that something's wrong with us. And the more and more I appreciate it, you know, even talking to family members and other 
pub, people in the public, like particularly in the climate there's 2020, so many people have had suicidal ideation. So many people have had these ultimate doubts in themselves and it might just be a fleeting moment or it might not be, but just connecting through and having those conversations makes them feel more human, makes them feel like it's all right. And instead of holding on to it with apprehension and fear, it actually releases it and helps them be less likely to actually do that again because they, they feel more value, they feel more, you know, a, a part of being human is the connection there. I forgot where I was going with that. Well, I think you're busy fostering human connection. You've mm. founded Voice of a Veteran and to continue opening up those conversations. And I, yeah, it's yeah. not about, I'm, I'm grateful you've come on here, for example, to share your story because yeah. people will want to gain insight into you. But yeah. it's not about you or Scotty Evanett, who you're co-hosting with. It is about starting conversations. Well, that's it. And Scotty was one of the first conversations I had talking about this. Um, because Scotty had been pretty much alienated from our community when he went out and commercialised himself out of service and he'd been a little bit verbal about um, some of his things he'd been through and we just randomly ran into each other in a, a Canberra connection just started talking and again having these conversations about going to that low, low place and then he like completely confided in me how he went to his low, low place and then we just really both reflected afterwards on that conversation and it was just talking and this is this narrative I'm trying to turn around with like mental fitness. You know, we all save these up for mental health sessions with our psychologists or psychiatrists but having these conversations and the more of my guys, my former platoon guys from both Five Platoon, Bravo Company, 2RR and November Platoon, 2 Commander that I just have these conversations with, it's, it's just health on a tap, you know. It just unlocks um, and helps me feel so much better after every session and it's just like, hey, we need to do more of that. And this whole profile that I thought, you know, I could use to get cut through and attention in the media, I just ne actually need to use to achieve the cut through that it has within the wider defence force and the veteran community. You know, the, the special forces card um, is one that is there, that, that is w well and hard earned uh, by our training and our experience and the selection process and everything else in between. And it's also an incredible opportunity to, again, help lead by example for the first time in my life with actual moral courage being the preference as opposed to physical courage. And that was a, it was a huge transition point for me. And again, that's been the biggest success I've had is just actually stepping up and talking about that. And that's, that's even why I founded Voice of the Veteran because I still needed something that wasn't me doing it. You know, I needed something to hide behind, essentially. Um, I needed something to help me become more comfortable with that. And um, I was so verbal in my attacks on DVA, particularly in my own situation, and then I went down and engaged with DVA, and particularly in the lead-up to when we knew the Burton Report was going to be released, um, went there to try and offer some form of proactive outreach mechanism. I had a bunch of volunteers, and long story short, that didn't occur. But then next thing, all of a sudden, the and this is where most people know me and Voice of a Veteran from, was the Marine who said he heard a pop. You know, and that article came out from the ABC on the 21st of October, which was the eighth year anniversary of Scotty's death. And from that first time where we came back from deployment 2012 and then met Scott's mum and his sister at um, Bondi RSL. Since then, I'd been withdrawing a lot from that, and particularly during that two-year transition period, 2018-19. Uh, I really withdrew a lot from any of that. And, you know, I no longer went down there and I hadn't seen Scott's mum, Katrina, since um, 2012. And I was fully set up to finally, you know, I was finding my feet again after my low moment in, in August to, to go down and I was reconnecting with the guys I hadn't seen at uh, North Bondi again and Katrina, Scott's mum, was coming to it. It was the first time I was going to see her in eight years. And then all of a sudden that article came out on that day uh, and it, it, it was huge. It, it hurt. It really, really hurt because, like, for the first time in the media, like, November Platoon was named. You know, that's never happened before. It was unusual. That's yeah. never happened before. And it was named by a Marine who wouldn't give away his proper name, who was said it was during a, a mission in Hellman, which were all night missions. Um, and he was in a Huey, which was gun fire support. It wasn't picking up people. So he was at least a couple of thousand feet above the earth and said he heard a pop over the radio. You know, it was night time, so we ran suppressed weapon systems. While in a Huey, he heard well, a pop. Well, in a Huey. And, you know, eight years later, the fact that, the ABC were allowed to publish a story that, you know, I'd already been in the newspapers beforehand talking about my mental health plight, you know. It'd been picked up by the media. I'd done a few interviews uh, and all that. And the next thing, 
you know, because they have to go to defence and ask them these things. November platoon 2012 is Heston Russell. You know, I was a platoon commander. Um, there was not a single Australian that was interviewed uh, to fact check that story. Uh, and it was done at such a time that was so traumatic for us. And so, speci- like, November platoon was getting together to commemorate our lost dude uh, on the eighth year anniversary like, with his mum. Um, you know, so many people have said, mate, it's probably an attack that came for you for speaking out so heavily against DVA, but I'm not going to buy into conspiracy theories. But that's when I, I just, like, enough is enough. Like, you can attack me, but you can't attack my dudes. And you were attacking, like, the ideology and this identity that we were coming together to commemorate, like, the loss of one of our fallen who gave the ultimate sacrifice. Um, so I spoke up on social media. And then, you know, next thing... Uh, enough people saw me speak up on social media because the project also went to air um, and really dove in a little bit further on it. And they had you, but they had you on as a guest. Yeah, well, yeah. I was going to say so. The project and ABC jumped on it, so it first went to air on the ABC, and the next thing, the project that night, um, old Waleed and a few others like jumped into it and really started to spin it. In and a, you came back on the Sunday project, is that right? No, it came it was, in a different direction. Oh, okay, and sorry. Then, I got on my social media and said, hey, look, enough's enough. I was the commander of November Platoon. Like, this did not happen. I'd happily speak with anyone from the ABC and Channel 10, like, to let you know the facts from someone who's actually there on the ground because all that you have is a, um, not even eyewitness, an ear witness report from someone who was in the helicopter at night time, blah, 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 blah. And enough people jumped on social media and ran for me and actually engaged with friends who were producers here and, you know, the, the human terrain did its thing. It was amazing to see that social media do its thing. And next thing I had a, one of the producers from the project get in contact with me and just want to sit and chat. And we had a good chat. And he's like, all right, um, I, there's clear there's a lot more to this. Um, I'm going to link in with one of the guys, which ended up being uh, Peter Van O, uh, PVO. And we went in and, and had the, the one-on-one story and it sort of all went from there. Uh, you know, yep, you were on uh, there. Sky News Sky repeatedly, News Sunrise, I've, yeah, and you've just continued your campaign yeah. very stridently. And that was the, the the key thing was it sort of really meshed it all together for me because that public attack on the guys was enough to really send more of a ripple through what was already a very vulnerable mental and emotional health situation within our community as we're leading up to this Burton report there'd been all these leaks in the news you know the special forces were really getting painted as you know these evil criminals and you know this report is going to dictate all this is going to reveal all this and there was zero positivity about all the things that had occurred over there there's so much that more that needs to be discussed and I really saw it as um, my chance to really take up the fight to preserve as much as that identity that you know, I needed to personally because that was the greatest version of me and let alone that for my community that was openly under attack in the media and no one else could speak up because they're all current serving and all that good stuff. And So I just started doing what I was trained to do and literally just speaking the truth um, and having enough courage to do so and um, the amount of people who reached out and told me how much it was starting to help them really helped me push through my own self-doubts and that's where we are today. Indeed, today you are still leading by moral courage. You've got your own profile, voice of a veteran, the social media presence, the website, the podcast that's just launched. It's full guns going. Mm-hmm. I can see the purpose that's driving you and purpose has been a core part of your whole life. Yeah. You always also plan what's next. Yeah. What is next? I don't know. So I, again, have been a frog in a hot water, which I actually enjoy with a lot of these things, whereby um, you know, even jumping into really doing a critical analysis of the ESO space, so the ex-service organisation space. There's over 3,000 ex-service organisations and that's a, a symptom of the fact that the after-service care for our veterans is inadequate. Um, you know, I don't talk about DVA. Um, so as great veterans do, we're great at solving problems. So we pop up a new ESO that deals with these problems and, you know, there are so many ESOs out there doing such a fantastic job, but particularly as I found myself and even engaging with, you know, these mentally and emotionally wounded veterans now that come from a place of just being devalued during their transition and no one listening to them or feeling their own value, that all of a sudden they have this outlet, you know, and it's, it's, there's so much goodwill and hope out there. And so many of these ESOs are goodwill and hope and do such amazing things. But we're now at the point whereby the space is so full that it actually gives people so much anxiety and it actually provides more uncertainty and essentially can potentially even destabilise veterans further in that transition process. 
um, and some of them have become more commercially focused, you know. Um, where was the RSL when the Meritorious Unit Citation issue came about? Where were some of these huge organisations that have hundreds of millions of dollars while, um, you know, myself with one other are there leading a campaign, you know, spending our own money <laughs> to take up a fight for nothing other than... But that's than, leadership and but, you're just doing by example. For nothing other than it's the right thing to do. And it really got me um, angry at all of these organisations that I know that I'd really thrown my back into supporting our veteran community and so many others do financially. Um, so it made me then start having a look at what was needed in this space and what's next is doing what we've been doing and engaging further directly with veterans to seeing what they need, who's helping them, who's not helping them, and helping to shine a spotlight on that. Voice of a veteran, and I refuse to be, like I said before to you, I refuse to do something that someone else can do. I want to do something that I'm best placed to do um, because I have the skills to do it or I'm happy to accept the risk in doing it. You know, um, There's definitely plenty of people who unfortunately are put out by what I'm trying to do, but my purpose is supporting veterans. Um, and all of them that I talk to need help to navigate that afterlife, uh, after service life. There needs to be fixes within the defence system that actually prepares people for leaving the military as soon as they join it. You know, better veterans make better Australians. And we need to shift the role of the military to not only to defend Australia and its national interests, those national interests are also producing the best version of those Australians that come in and come out of service. Um, and that's what they, they should be doing. You know, I have the, the, every, every service man and woman has the skills, knowledge and attributes that should make them a better Australian citizen. We just need to fix that process. But that is a big one that needs to be done from the inside, you know, and there are people like our politicians, our elected members and our military leaders that are the ones who are entrusted with that and I can't do that on the outside. DVA needs a complete overhaul and fix. It needs to be consolidated in providing liability and compensation and removing even any of that expectation of it actually providing care from our veterans. And even that is just an expect expectation management piece in the veteran community. So while people like you know Jackie Lambie and again our elected officials can take that fight to DVA, I want to best support the veteran community by getting out there and trying to communicate things like, hey, don't expect them to care. You know, expectation management, take control of your own life, take control of your own situations. So my next step there is to really support some of the cultural change I think needs to occur within the veteran community in order for us to revert back to those values, um, those attributes, those skill sets that saw us to be our best in service and that's taking control of our narrative, you know. Part of my thing with Voice of Veteran is to start to take control of the veteran narrative because I'm sick of having other people talk about us. It's time for us to talk about ourselves and to do so with responsibility, not entitlement, to do so to help each other unite together because we are a pretty powerful team when we can be together and to try and set their mechanisms to do so and at the same time doing whatever I can from a ground up culture approach um, by again bringing people together helping bring them together to solve each other's problems because if you can't solve your own problem there's probably another veteran who has had that experience who can help you before you start getting to a place of like I can't solve my problem it's hopeless I'm helpless um, and then Again, from the ground up, seeing where we need to provide more support to veterans after service, really shine a light on those ex-service organisations that are doing that. I want to be a spotlight and a megaphone for those who are doing the right things. And for those who are not, I want to find out why uh, and get enough information to just basically provide it to the Australian public, to provide it to the veteran community, to just demonstrate that they're not doing it. Uh, to avoid veterans from going there and perpetuating these behaviours that are leaving them feeling hopeless and helpless again. Um, I don't know what's next for me after that. I just know that that's what I need to do here and now. Um, and part of that is also accountability. A huge part of it for me is accountability. Um, and I could go off on such a tangent here at the moment, but you've heard me be so vocal about the need for a Royal Commission you know, we're at, a pl we're at a point where now over 700 veterans have taken their own life and they're only the ones we know about. You know, I'm hearing terrible stories each week about veterans being more inventive in the way and they're killing themselves to make it not look like suicide so that their family can have access to their insurance and stuff like this. You know, we're, we're smart, adaptable, trainable people. Um, it's sad when that's being applied to the craft of killing ourselves, of them killing themselves. Uh, so 
unfortunately, it's all become so political, you know, and that's just the nature of things at the moment. I actually like to simply go back to what we do in the military and focus on the end state effects. What's the result we need? The whole conversation around veteran suicide and the mental health crisis we're in the moment and now it's 700 and the government's in action to do some very simple preventative processes and hold DVA accountable in the, in the, in the path comes down to, to the need for those 700 plus people and their families to um, be respected, um, for there to be recognition that we have lost more people than we should have. And that's not just me saying that. That's the simple fact that within service, the suicide rate of veterans is way below the community average. Outside of service, it's a third to a half, depending upon the demographics, above everyday Australian citizens. So what we're doing in service within the culture is at least good enough to have our people committing suicide far less than their equivalent outside in in the community. But then when those veterans transition, they're more likely to commit suicide than their average person on the street. Like, there's something wrong in there, and that still refuses to be um, recognised by the government and by the systems who are responsible for that. So, unfortunately, in order to provide recognition and accountability for those failings of those systems, the only current proper legal process that could achieve that independent to any government body is a Royal Commission. But what we also need is immediate action here and now to get out there and start proactively having a look at, hey, what's the highest risk of person that we know has been in these suicide categories? And we have this. We have tables and tables and reports and reports of, you know, male, female, under the age of 30, most likely separated with uh, some reason that they didn't want to. You'd be that administratively separated or even, you know, multiple deployments. I can even just look at that special forces demographic and immediately there's search criteria that you could literally put in and, hey, here's a list of 500 people we need to start calling. They're not doing that. Um, But that's what's needed here and now. So we need a Royal Commission to consolidate where we've been, provide respect, recognition and accountability. And then we need this separate element that is out there conducting proactive suicide prevention. Um, You know, and that's what this Dr Boss and the um, Interim National Commissioner is meant to be stood up to do. But they've been given the task to do both. And it just doesn't hold up to military tactics 101. You can't have two main efforts. Um, You can't give the due diligence, even from a superficial perspective, to the requirement over here in the recognition of the 700 plus we've lost and fully immerse yourself in getting out there and saving lives. Um, You need to allow one to do its process and throw yourself more into the other. And now it's just become so political that I honestly wish I could just back away from it. But the more and more, and I spent the last month up in Queensland, going over to Perth, up to Townsville, Brizzy, Sunny Coast, engaging with the veteran community, It is now so much more important as a part of that cultural change that's needed in the veteran community for them to see that accountability. Because, for instance, like we saw with the Brereton Report, with, you know, the Chief of the Defence Force coming out at the end of an inquiry, not an investigation, an inquiry, the rules of evidence have not even been applied and stating that we're going to revoke the meritorious unit citation from 3,000 Special Forces personnel that includes 20 fallen veterans. It's just, you know... Again, as a, as a professionally trained leader, like that's just not what you do. That's, that's a politician. Um, and you've heard me say enough about that. I don't need to harp on about that. But what that has done is sent those seeds of doubt that I had back on my um, deployment to Afghanistan, on my deployment to Iraq, those seeds of doubt in the direction where we're heading, the strategic appetite, let alone the personal leadership of those responsible for entire defence force, to ripple down through to the very lowest ranks. You know, I've sat with a 24-year-old, guy, veteran, current serving veteran sniper up in Townsville, you know, who, you know, he was just such a quietly spoken dude and you could tell it was like just even uncomfortable for him to have the conversation. But when someone's talking to you and you just see the emotion behind his eyes and he's just like, I and we want to do something, you know, we see what's going on and we want to speak out but we can't and, you know, you just feel that emotional transfer of just losing that trust in those who are meant to be responsible for them um, and not seeing then accountability being held at that top level how th- it starts to erode at their their purpose it starts to erode at their belief system it starts to erode at um, them believing that they need to go out there and sacrifice themselves when others are not being held accountable in the most public of forum you know, over things that aren't life or death decision, over things that you could happily step back and say, hey, I'm sorry, we made a mistake, I'm human, I acted on the wrong, 
information, you know. We're seeing pride and entitlement take precedence over responsibility and leadership. So now I sort of have this bit of a, a mission, a bit of a crusade to, you know, ensure that accountability is laid because we're at this melting pot whereby there's a chance for our future culture to always be defined here and now and if I can have any part to play in that, I want it to go back to what I, I knew it could be, you know, that the true and authentic purpose that's aligning people on mission, focus on results and caring how you're doing what you're doing and demonstrating the very best of what we should be demonstrating as military personnel to the Australian people, um, let alone special forces and anything else aside. So I, I, <laughs> what's next, Heston? I don't know. It's cultural change. It's cultural change wherever I can affect it. It's cultural change within the veteran community to, again, group ourselves up. And it's cultural change for everyone else to realise that you can influence at the very top level from wherever you are, as long as you're doing it for the right reasons. Uh, you just have to find a way to do it. And that's what I've been trained my whole life to do. And at the moment, the media and social media is my weapon, but I refuse to be simply a squeaky wheel. I refuse to simply scream at the moon. I have to get in there and roll up my sleeves and get it done. And that's what I'm trying to really decide and plan on how I can actually best literally get myself in there and get involved and make it happen. I don't think anyone could rightly accuse you of being a squeaky wheel, <laughs> Heston. You are substance. You are action. If someone is to shine a light on this and carry a torch for moral courage, accountability and strong leadership, you've demonstrated that your entire Special Forces career. I can say the cliche, thank you for your service and all that, but I actually want to really thank you for the work you are doing now because it is important, it is inspiring, and that's not as a compliment to you, but that is a recognition of you are filling a gap, you're filling a need, and you've stepped up to the plate. So thank you for that on behalf of so many listening and watching this. No, and I really appreciate that. And I mean, as you can imagine, I, ha I have a purpose again, you know, and I've had to really sit down and do a very quick and constant self-assessment um, on, you know, am I simply just jumping into a purpose again because I finally feel whole again? Um, you know, particularly there was that initial crazy media frenzy um, when the Burton Report got released and... You were everywhere. Yep. Yeah, and, you know, so many people like, you know, be careful you're not seen to be a media whore or whatever and all this. And uh, I, I, during that time, you know, I, in that lead up and that spiral down to where I was, I sort of cut myself away from a lot of those people who were around me trying to get things out of me. And, you know, I, I had only a, a few handful of people around me. My sister actually moved down here from from Brisbane and she was the first person you know before I'd go in for an interview it's like hey remember why you're doing this okay remember all the responsibility you're taking into this um, don't get a big head don't try and attack these people um, you know because at this time was, I'm very good thinking and talking on my feet but again you know I have like it's, it's come from 15 or 16 years worth of corporate knowledge you know whereas reporters are just trying to jump on headlines and trying to enact emotion out of you and get headlines but people that I surrounded myself with people who kept me grounded um, and it was also just making sure that I wasn't jumping onto um, chasing ambulances. Now all of a sudden you're in this presence, you're in this profile, it's very easy to become uh, a bit absorbed with it and it was so critical for me to maintain my own thing is that, hey, don't also go out there and generate uncertainty, anxiety within the community. You know, go out there for the, divine, the design responsibility um, and the purpose that you have. So... Um, yeah, it's been, it's been fascinating also appreciating that this has really, really helped me finally put all my lives together and appreciate that the worst thing I ever did was jump from one thing to the next and, again, utilise this as the key time to help other veterans feel valued, help other veterans not make the same mistake as me, but actually, and as I've been doing this, understand it's the chance to actually help the Australian public better understand who veterans are. Because the biggest thing that I think has come out of this Burton report is that Australia really didn't understand what we were doing over there. The majority of the Australians didn't, let alone what our special forces were doing. And the more that we can utilise this opportunity to help better educate the wider Australian public on what we did over there, let alone what a veteran is. Um, because all that I kept seeing before this was the veteran mental health crisis, as opposed to how great our veterans can and have been and, and should be. Um, the, the better we actually do in paving the way for future veterans to feel more relevant, to feel more valued in everyday society. And that's the key part whereby if we actually had a society that fully understood our veterans and actually supported them, not financially or emotionally, but actually supported them in being and challenging them to be 
the best people that we were in service, um, we would really have a better grip on this mental health crisis as well while then we actually do the processes and procedures to change it in service and the transition piece. So anyway. It's hard because you're, I guess to kind of wrap up, you're yeah. shining a light on the problems, but yeah. by doing so, by shining it so strongly and starting powerful, even if the challenging conversations, that also provides hope. Yeah, absolutely. That's it. And look, my biggest fear and concern and um, area of uneasement with myself is actually not capitalising on opportunities. As opposed to failure, I'm not afraid of failing, you know. If you, if you haven't failed yet, you haven't tried hard enough. But it's more so when there's opportunities and you have the capacity and capability to capitalise on as many opportunities while achieving the mission and purpose, that's um, what I need to do. Um, and while it feels like I'm speaking scatterbrained here to you at the moment, uh, it's, it all makes perfect sense in my head and there's just the most amazing people inspiring me along this journey and sending all their details in on social media and emails and it's just so amazing seeing um, just by having conversations what could be achieved and at the same time it is helping me heal personally and professionally so much as well and imagine like you're doing that with your own community at the same time so um, it's exciting times and having just these conversations with someone like yourself mate really again helps solidify that even further. Well, Heston, I can't wait to continue watching your journey and seeing what changes sweep through, and I wish you all the best for it. Likewise, I really appreciate it, mate. Thanks. Find out more about Heston Russell in the details in our episode description. You can also find our website and social media details there too. And this is just the first of many more veteran stories we have to tell this year. I'm very grateful to Heston for coming on the show and giving us his time. Life on the Line is brought to you by Thistle Productions, artwork by Big Cat Design, music by Dan Van Werkhoven. Thank you for listening or watching, and lest we forget. Mm-hmm.